Welcome to the urinary system part three. And this is uh, auto regulation. What does auto mean? Self, self regulating. What do the kidneys need? Good blood pressure. Where are they close to? Aorta. And so then they're going to have good blood pressure. Um, but if by chance the blood pressure is low, what's going to be released? I want you to just recall what is released. Starts with an R. Okay, got it, it's renin. Okay, so what does renin do? What does it act on? So I want you to go with me on this uh, cycle. Renin acts on angiotensinogen. What does it become? Angiotensin 1, what does it become? Angiotensin 2, what does angiotensin 2 cause the release of? Aldosterone, what does aldosterone do? And aldosterone then, as we were thinking, I'm just going to quickly draw just a diagram here so that we've got this. And when we look at this, we know 80% of the water was reabsorbed on this side, but 19% over on this side depended on ADH or and aldosterone. What does aldosterone work on? The reabsorption of sodium and chloride, and water follows. And so if aldosterone causes retention of sodium and chloride in water, then the person is, is going to have that retention and uh, that's what we're going to see as well. Now, if they retain the water, what's going to happen to the blood volume? It will increase. If the blood volume increases, what will happen to the blood pressure? And, of course, the blood pressure increases if you can get the blood volume up. What could cause blood volume to go down? Hemorrhaging, definitely. That's a big thing that could do it. And so, uh, if that uh, blood volume has gone down, then that is concerned. Dehydration, it can decrease the blood volume. And so then we've got a need to increase blood pressure. Let's look. Over here on the diagram that you've got, this is on page 61, then I want you to look. Um, here's the complex. It's the juxtaglomerular complex. And so the juxtaglomerular cells <coughs> or granular cells right here, sorry, uh, the purple, are going to be the baroreceptors. We know that baro means pressure, and so just like barometer, it's pressure, and they're going to notice if there's low blood pressure in the afferent arterial. If there's low blood pressure there, and if the chemoreceptors that notice the concentration of sodium and chloride in the distal convoluted tubule, those two together make the juxtaglomerular complex. What do they do? They cause the release of renin. And renin then is going to cause the cycle that we just talked about with the angiotensinogen, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, and the release of aldosterone. Now, as you look at this, you can see it's the arterial. It's going to be the pressure receptor. It's the distal convoluted tubule having the macula densa cells. Now, as we look at that, I also want you to go in your notes um, to where it talks about angiotensin II. And for that one, you can see the aldosterone. And of course, it's causing the retention of sodium, chloride, and water. But what else happens there? Angiotensin II also affects the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus has the osmoreceptors. And osmoreceptors respond to uh, thirst control. If you are thirsty, the osmoreceptors are going to respond. And so this is what we're seeing. If you're thirsty, you're probably dehydrated. And so, of course, low blood volume. And low blood volume would be noticed by the chemoreceptors. And so that's what we see. But the hypothalamus is going to be the one in charge of this. Also, I want you to notice that ADH is released. And so if ADH is released, what did ADH do? I want you to look back at the diagram that we've got here. And what was it that ADH would do to the collecting tubule? Remember that it opened aquaporins. And if it opened aquaporins, it was going to retain water. And by retaining water, what did it do to the blood volume? And so when we think of that, if it can increase the blood volume, it will increase the blood pressure. And that was the goal uh, for this juxtaglomerular complex. And that's the auto-regulation 
for the kidney. Now, there are some terms here that I want you to just go over briefly. I'm sure that you're quite familiar with them. They're in the textbook as well. And so I'm just going to look. Um, there's a couple of them that I want you to be sure that you know, are familiar with because people sometimes get them confused. And so, I want you to look at those. I'm going to underline the parts and I want you to break the words down so that you can see what is happening. So as we look at this for hematuria, that's an easy one. If we look at it, what does hema mean? And of course, what's this part? Blood in the urine. In your notes, you'll notice it could be due to uh, trauma. It could be um, kidney stones. Those are common. The other thing would be long-standing diabetes mellitus. It could actually release red blood cells into the urine. For this one, this is emia, and emia means blood. In the textbook, it says this part means urine, but I prefer that you say urea, because it's not urine in the blood, it's urea that's in the blood. And so that's what is here. It's the urea, it's the toxins that are here, it's creatinine, that's in the blood. And so now, what I want you to do is look at this term right here. What does this mean? What's AN? And I know you know this, so here we got it. It means no. And so here we've got no urine. It's minimal amount of urine that's being made. Now I want you to think, would anurea cause uremia? And so I'm just going to wipe this out. So if there's hardly any urine being produced, is urea going to back up in the blood? Are the toxins and the creatinine going to back up in the blood? And then of course, anurea does cause uremia. What is a treatment for uremia? That's when they need dialysis uh, or they're a candidate for a kidney transplant. And so we've got this right here. Now, those terms that you've got, there's a specific gravity down on number 9 and 10 on page 64, uh, is it 64, 61, that I want you to look at that right now, specific gravity. Now, I'm going to put two things here. One will be diabetes mellitus. One will be diabetes insipidus. And what's going to be the specific gravity for them? Thinking back to the lab, you probably recall what could be, and what was the normal specific gravity? It ranged from 1.001 to 1.035. So if they're an uncontrolled diabetic, it's going to be closer to this. If they have diabetes insipidus, it's going to be 1.002 or something in that. Why? because they're putting out 20 liters of dilute urine a day. Why are they putting out that much urine? And so we're going to see that on the following page. I do want you to look at number eight on this page 61 for proteinuria. And once again, would you please underline where it says proteinuria or albuminuria. This is an early marker of kidney disease. If there's proteins leaking out, then something's wrong uh, with the glomerulus and the podocytes. Now, let's go over to the following page. And for this one, disorders. I'm going to put this up. Okay, let's look at this for acute renal failure. First of all, I want you to tell me what's the normal glomerular filtration rate. And so, that's what we're looking for. And so the normal is 125 milliliters per minute. If you do all the math on it, it comes out to 180 liters per day. 
but here we've got this. Now, they can test this, see that what it is, but here we've got that amount. This is important as we look at renal failure. So first one that we've got, you've got acute, and later you'll see chronic. We know what acute is. It came on pretty much overnight. Chronic, they've had this for 20, 30 years. And so chrono, if you've ever been at a race, there's chrono mix, and chrono is for timing. And this means time. And so it's taken time to develop. But now then, let's look at acute renal failure. What could cause this? Um, antifreeze, uh, ethylene glycol, um, or let me look in here and we'll just see some of the examples that you've got. Um, ethylene glycol and antifreeze, um, this can actually cause the, the tubule cells to die. They block this off, and if they block it off, the urine's not coming out. And if the urine's not coming out, they're going into anuria, renal failure, and besides, they've got these cells are dying. Uh, in your notes right there, it says ischemia. We know that ischemia is decreased blood flow. What's happened is that this has actually affected the tubule cells. They now aren't getting the oxygen, they're dying and then they block this and the urine can't go out. What might the glomerular filtration rate be? And if we look in the notes, you can see it's less than 15. Oh, they're only putting out 15 milliliters per minute. They need dialysis. And so this is a concern. Um, I know that sometimes with uh, even a respiratory disorder that is extreme, like H1N1, uh, then it can cause them to go into a uh, renal failure. And possibly you remember me telling you about uh, a man who'd had H1N1, and he was um, transported to Calgary immediately, and they put him on dialysis, put him in a coma, but because he actually recovered, uh, then his, his tubules and that came back and were working. But this was the amount, acute renal failure right there. For chronic renal disease, as you look at this, um, the glomerular filtration right there, less than 60. So they're not putting out as much, but it's a chronic, it's gone on for a time. And this could be, uh, as you look in your notes, diabetes mellitus, and in the textbook, uh, it will say diabetes mellitus is responsible for uh, 44% and hypertension for 28% of these people having the chronic renal disease. I want you to put on number three, chronic renal failure. So put chronic there as well. And here we've got a uh, glomerular filtration rate is less than 15. And so once again, they've got minimal amount of urine being made. Now for this one, They've got scarring and atrophy occur in the uh, glomerulus, but I want you to look at the treatment. And the treatment, of course, at that point, if this is all they're putting out, they need dialysis, or if, if they're fortunate, they might get a kidney transplant. Now the next, would you look at nephrotic syndrome? A syndrome means there's a lot of things going on, not just one thing. And so nephrotic syndrome, what's happening? And for this one, Okay, let's go back to here. And for the nephrotic syndrome, the podocytes have now been damaged. And so if you're looking in here, and there we've got those footed cells, podocytes that are damaged. What are they doing? They're now allowing albumins to go through. And when the albumins, which are proteins, are going out in the urine, so they're going out here, they don't have as many in the bloodstream. Now, if you think of which pressure is affected, it's osmotic pressure. So osmotic pressure decreases. If osmotic pressure decreases, what are they going to uh, develop? A 
edema. And what will edema do? Well, it's going to have fluid that's collecting in the body. It's going to make a lower blood volume. And right now, we are going to look at what happens if there's low blood volume. And the, the kidneys will respond. What will they respond with? They're going to then release renin. And when they release renin, it's going to cause the angiotensin cycle. So I'm just going to go through it briefly with you. Renin acts on angiotensinogen, becomes angiotensin 1, becomes angiotensin 2, and then it causes the release of aldosterone. What does aldosterone do? It's going to cause the reabsorption of the sodium chloride and actually, over on this side, the water. Now, when it does that, then it's just increasing the problem with the edema. This is the nephrotic syndrome. And so this is what we're seeing. Now, um, nephrotic syndrome, uh, the, with the albumins leaking out, this is a, a big concern for people. If you look um, underneath this one, I want to go to diabetes insipidus just for a moment. You've got it right there. And we've already talked about diabetes insipidus, but let's look once more. What is happening over on this side? And I'm just going to quickly put So diabetes insipidus, these people, the posterior pituitary gland is not making antidiuretic hormone. If it's not making antidiuretic hormone, then the aquaporins that were supposed to take the water from the tubule into the um, capillary are not working. If they're not open and working and, and taking this back into the bloodstream, where is it going? It's going out. Now, I want you to just recall this line. This side of the nephron is permeable to water and osmosis is going to reabsorb. What percent of the water is reabsorbed on this side? Okay, hopefully you thought 80%. 80% is reabsorbed here. What percent normally is reabsorbed on this side because of ADH or aldosterone, 19%. We add them both together, we've got 99% normally is reabsorbed, 1% goes out in the urine. What happens when there's no ADH? This is not reabsorbed. And so then they can put out 20 to 40 liters of urine, and of course it's dilute. And this is the problem. If it's dilute urine, I want you to recall specific gravity. What's the specific gravity going to be? Okay, I'm going to give you a choice. Is it going to be about 1.002 or 1.020? Okay, hopefully you went with 1.002 because it's almost like water. And this is what we're seeing with the diabetes insipidus. It is putting this out. Now, if you'll go over, oh, there is a drug. There's um, actually a medication that replaces the ADH. Let's go over just briefly. I want to look at diabetes mellitus with you. For diabetes mellitus, then I'm just going to take this off. And of course, what does mellitus mean? Sweet. And so why did they call it mellitus? Uh, the reason was that the urine was sweet. And so with insipidus, it was bland. It was like water. Uh, so what's happening here in order for the urine to be sweet? And so I'm just going to do a, a quick diagram. And I want you to recall over here, 
what was going to be the amount of glucose normally reabsorbed. And so when we look at glucose, normally active transport 100% was reabsorbed. But now they've got a problem. They have got more glucose than they can reabsorb. There's only so many transporters for the glucose and they've overloaded them. Why did they overload them? Because the body is now burning fats instead of glucose and glucose is going out in the urine. What does glucose do as it goes out in the urine? It draws water with it. And this is where it's going to be the osmotic diuretic. What was the term for that? And here we can see this one, polyuria. Now poly, lots, frequent urination, frequent drinking. And so if they're going to urinate lots, they've got to drink lots. And this would be the case. It could be, and often it's in a, a small child, or it could be up till 18 years old, but often um, they, they're just drinking lots of water and going to the bathroom lots. And so this is what we're seeing for the diabetes mellitus. We're going to see it again in the endocrine um, unit. And so we'll check that. I want you to look at nephrolithiasis. Are you pretty familiar with this one? It meant kidney stone. And of course it causes pain, hematuria. And on the, um, all the PowerPoints, then I put some pictures of laser lithotripsy and the shockwave lithotripsy to fracture the stones. Uh, I'm going to just slip down to uh, dialysis and look at this just briefly. And for this one, now when you look at this, of course, hemo meaning blood, and this is where the person's blood is actually put through the machine. And in that way, it's uh, the toxins are removed and the nutrients are replaced and the person comes out feeling with just more energy because they've been dealing with this condition right here. And of course, what was uremia? It was the buildup of the urea and the toxins in the blood and then they go through the dialysis and it gets removed. Um, the other one that's listed there, continuous ambulatory uh, peritoneal dialysis, when they were wondering how could they possibly help people who can't come to the dialysis unit all the time, they determined let's put it into the peritoneal cavity. And so with that, that was the accomplishment. What they have to do is drain it out um, and then routinely put in fresh dialysate. But it makes it so the person could be at home. And that gets us through the information that we've got. Um, for this uh, be sure that you uh, get ready for the quiz. The quiz will be up until Saturday at 5 o'clock. And so good luck with the studies.